Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, that's Tox and Tasting Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast, the show that shows you what's behind the collar. I'm Bull Hagen, and I'm Bull Hagen, and I'm Bull Hagen. Just me. But wait a minute. You hear that music? You know what that music means? That's right. You're taking a step into the preacher studio. A look behind the collar of what goes into a sermon. And today's special is the anatomy of a funeral sermon. As we begin, one thing I want to clarify when you talk about a funeral sermon is sometimes people say, well, the funeral sermon really doesn't really care for the person who died. It's for the, the people who are there. And um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, it is for those who are gathered, but faithful Christians, when they think about their funeral... They actually think about it in a certain way as a confession of faith. And that's one thing that you see in the preparations for this funeral. Uh, The hymns from our hymnal and one from from TLH, shout out to you, Berg, um, that were used today uh, were, were chosen by the one who had died. And the readings as well. And because for a lot of faithful Christians, the funeral service is kind of seen as one of their last confession of faith that they make. People gather at the funeral um, and uh, the ones who are gathered are the people they love the most, the dearest of family of friends. And the funeral service and the sermon matters a lot to them. I can tell you that in my pastoral work, when someone's dying, they often really do want to talk about their funeral. They want to make sure that uh, the word of God is clearly heard. And uh, when, they, when they die, it helps them die in peace knowing that that will happen at their funeral. And uh, often, they already know where they stand before the Lord through the forgiveness of sins. Their concern is for their friends, specifically for their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And so, for them to know that the service for their funeral will be in the church and that it will be of Christ Jesus and that their dearest ones will hear that word of God and the gospel is very, very helpful and comforting to them. It helps them in their last moments of life to know. And with this in mind, a eulogy for them would almost be embarrassing. Uh, The people who know them and care about them know them better than I would in most cases, sometimes I actually see them more than their old family does in shut-in situations. But they want their loved ones more than anything else to be in church and hearing of Christ. And so the funeral service is a confession of faith for them. And in, in, ca- in many cases, um, I speak up for them as a child of God to the family. That's what they wanted. Which means that I am intentional when I speak to uh, people in the church about their own funerals and their wishes. And uh, when I talk to them about their wishes, you know, I make sure that their wishes are in line with our confession, first of all. And the hymns are in line with our confession. But I also, in planning them and talking about with them... uh, I want them to be able to express hymns and scriptures that were important to them so that they can have that chance of expressing the faith of Christ to their family and to their loved ones. And that's very important for them. And hymns from the hymnal express those things too. So in the case of this funeral, her name is Alice, a very precious daughter, a child of God. She chose several hymns and several scripture readings that expressed the comfort she had. Isaiah 61, I greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul 
uh, shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of my salvation. Beautiful, beautiful words of the gospel. And she also wanted John 14, 1 to 6, uh, where Jesus says, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So with that understood, that the, the funeral service is actually to give peace to the loved one as well, or to the one who is dying, or looking at death, or thinking about it, even if they're in perfectly fine condition, they think about it. That means also the funeral service in general matters to the entire congregation. Meaning a funeral isn't done in an example. How a funeral is treated in one in in at one point to the church really matters when it comes to other funerals. If a funeral is done where the confession isn't clear, the hymns aren't clear, and it becomes uh, something different, that changes how people view their own funeral. And so there is a consistency there. One one way I see that is with the use of our funeral pall. Um, at first, people were hesitant to use a funeral pall. What is this? This, this uh, white garment you place over the casket. But then as time went on, people realized there's a consistency. You know, funeral after funeral, uh, the, the, the body is, is uh, rolled in with the same garment. And that is a, a garment that reflects the righteousness of Christ with a cross on it and, and embroidery. The heavenly looking piece of, uh, of material that reflects that. And so, when you get to a funeral, all of that is kind of built up into the funeral that you are have in the present moment. You have many other brothers and sisters in Christ in that place, in that church, wearing the same garment. And some particular notes about particularly a funeral sermon. Sometimes I have people ask me, is it hard to write a funeral sermon? And in, in, in many ways, it's actually easy because they might say, well, there have been times where you didn't get a chance to know them very well. And, and that is the case. You know, an emergency situation in a different congregation where I'm called in or the pastor's out of town or something like that where I really don't know. It's, it's very rare. But nonetheless, the word of God stays the same. And so when I work on a funeral and, and what I've learned in my over 200 funeral sermons to make it easier is uh, it's always good for for the text or the sermon to be very textual, meaning based on a specific Bible reading. Because what it does is it keeps a funeral sermon focused. You've probably been to a funeral where the sermon was just kind of a ragtag ideas and thoughts just kind of all kind of jumbled together and kind of pasted and stories about their life and then this uh, thought of faith and this thought of Jesus being with you and all these things and it it doesn't really have a coherent coherent thought or track that the uh, people can really grab a hunt grab onto and one way is to help keep the funeral sermon focused is to to make it very textual have a text that you're preaching on and then stick to that text and use the details of the text specifically how it speaks uh in, in the setting that those words are spoken by Jesus or in the Old Testament or Psalm, and how that setting then speaks to the current situation of the child who is in Christ or those who are mourning. And it also keeps you from the pastor from simply driving the narrative, meaning I kind of want to say everything I want to say, and then I will use a Bible verse here, a Bible verse there to kind of to prove my point. I think it's it's more edifying for the, the hearer of the sermon to hear what God's word says and allow the point be directly from God's word that you're applying to the situation and to the child of God. And uh, perhaps you've heard a funeral sermon like that where it's kind of just a salt and pepper of kind of texts or proof texts where the pastor says whatever he wanted to say and then he just uses a text to prove that. Now that being said, there are times where there's certain points I want to make depending on uh, the occasion. Maybe it was a strange death. Maybe it was an interesting family situation. Um, maybe uh, it was a sudden death or people are struggling with things in a different way. Maybe it's a time of the year. Whatever the case may be where there's something I want to bring in. Well, that's when I choose a text 
uh, for the funeral. It's not a lectionary. I can choose whatever text I want. Um, and, uh, um, and so I will use then a text that speaks who I want, and I will still make sure the sermon is still centered on that particular text. And uh, especially young and new pastors, I would say this. Um, if you're having trouble writing a funeral sermon, the best thing you can do is keep it textual. You already know how to do that. You already know how to write a sermon. You do it every Sunday uh, based on a text of the lectionary. So have a text, preach that text, and then place it in the occasion uh, that you're preaching, particularly the funeral. Fill in the blanks. How does that text speak to what is going on right now before you? As a, a child of God has died, and then uh, his place is is in Christ. And uh, the other thing, I, I I've been to a lot of funerals because I, I try and if there's like a family member who has died of one of the members or something, I try and go to the funeral now and again. And uh, one thing that has annoyed me, and I didn't realize how much this was a thing until I've gone to funerals, is uh, how often. The resurrection is just given kind of lip service. Kind of like we're supposed to talk about resurrection there in heaven, la da 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 da. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about something really important. And it's never as important as the resurrection. It's never as important as the forgiveness of sins. And, oh, just, I'm, I'm serious. It, it drives me insane to hear that. Because you have people who don't necessarily understand the gospel at a funeral and you have a time where they're most open to hear it I think because they're in a situation that without the gospel you are going to have trouble wrapping your mind around what is going on and so often uh, pastors just want to skip over the really meat of what it's of what's going on it's f for some spiritualism or just some happy thoughts or some things that you could just find in a Hallmark greeting card as if it was more profound than the gospel is insane to me. And uh, you can tell it drives me it might drives me bonkers. But when it comes to this, you really need to explain it well. Not just give the resurrection the gospel lip service. La da 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 da. I know he's in heaven. Blah 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 blah. But explain it. This is how we know this child of God will rise again on the last day, be raised up by God. This is how we know the grave cannot hold him. This is how we know that God has promised through his son the great resurrection. And uh, if the listener of the sermon does not understand these things, does not understand the gospel, it's just going to be just another kind of jargon thing. Yeah, 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 we know they're in heaven. And uh, in fact, there's probably a percentage of people at a funeral sermon, they hear that and they, they kind of run through this. Oh, yeah, uh, they're in heaven and, uh, you know, they're watching down on me. And it, things like that. And it's just religious jargon that they think, well, this is what you say to everyone to help them feel better. You have to walk them through and you have to point it out. And you have to show this is why and how we know they are in the kingdom of heaven. How we know they will rise again on the last day. How we know Christ's promise is for them. And if you, if you don't, uh, if you don't, uh, if you want to hear a good example of this, just randomly pick any Martin Luther hymn. They're spectacular at this. Just take a moment, pause the podcast, grab a hymnal, pick any Martin Luther hymn, and read it. And you will see he doesn't give lip service to the gospel. He just says, oh, that's a given. Let's get into something more important, which is how so many treat it. He actually walks you through. This is how you know you need the gospel. This is how the law works. This is the death you have in your sin. And this is exactly what Jesus did to save it, and this is how it saves you, and this is how it brings you the resurrection, and this is how he delivers it, deliver, delivers it to you. He doesn't just give you lip service. He doesn't give you just kind of jargon that you can sing over and over again. He gives you, he walks you through the exact same thing in a hymn. And that's what you have to do with a funeral sermon. Uh, 
and and with that too, one thing I think too that's part of the delivery aspect of it is is it's really good to say it with confidence. Um, and to be specific about the joy of what it means to be with Jesus. Uh, the, you know, because there too, there's a spirituality that people don't understand. They don't understand what it means to be fully healed. They don't understand the joy of, of being in the glory of God. And so that too you have to point out. You have to walk them through this. This is what salvation is. They're not just bouncing around on clouds. God fully heals them. He gives them the power of the resurrection. He restores life to them as it meant was meant to be. And it is a real physical resu- uh, resurrection uh, that God will give them. These are things you have to. You have to clearly delineate for them because the average listener, especially at a funeral where it's a real mixed bag, they don't understand these things. And it's important that you give it to them, that they understand. You owe it. You owe it to the person, the child of God, who is placed before you, wrapped in a funeral pall, covered in the righteousness of Christ. You owe it to them that that is explained to the, to the people who are there gathered and not just given any kind of lip service or say the gospel is a given, they're in heaven, blah, 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 as though that's the least interesting thing you're going to say. There's also something that I've kind of latched on to probably more recently in my work in preaching funeral sermons. And that is, I think I used to be afraid of, so afraid of eulogizing, you know, someone, that I was actually afraid to show them as an example of faith in sermon, because I didn't want to utilize, you know, that's the last thing you want to do, eulogize. And uh, at the same time, you know, these treasures of the church, and, and many families, you know, when they're 90 years old, really have been the parable pillar of faith in their family. And for many people, they are a prime example of faith in, in their lives, and you don't want to just walk by that, okay? To eulogize is to talk about how good they are, but uh, to talk about their example of faith is to point the listener to Christ and his word. I mean, Jesus does it, does it, doesn't he? Doesn't he talk about great is your faith? He's not eulogizing them. He's talking about their trust. Uh, these, these children of God are examples of what faith looked like. They're examples of how their faith was a blessing to those around them. And uh, it gives us a chance to see what faith looks like here and what that faith looks like now in the kingdom of heaven. Eulogizing is simply talk about what a swell person they are. It points to their lives. It points to their works. It points to the things that their hands have done. But using them as an example of faith does the opposite. If you do it correctly, it points the listener to Jesus. It points the listener to the gospel. You see the difference? Eulogi- eulogizing points to the, the works of the person. What a swell person they are at their core. But using them as an example of faith, it, it, the faith points to Christ. It grasps to Christ. It points and holds the promises of God. And so that is... Uh, that is something I've kind of gotten more into probably in the last five or six years or so is, is doing some of that kind of language uh, because it's needed. Uh, people don't have a lot of examples like that in their life anymore. And, and when you have one, use it. Use it to their example of faith to point and lead them to in the same way trust Christ, trust the gospel, trust what Jesus says. So, the text that I am preaching on is uh, from John 14, 1 through 6, and this is a text that was chosen by Alice. She chose this, and, uh, and I will probably say this in the sermon, that she wanted this read um, for her funeral uh, from John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. 
How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is a, a standard, you know, you talk about a jazz standard. This is this is kind of the same way, a standard funeral text. And sometimes, uh, although it seems like it, it it's, it's an easy home run text, and, and, and it is in some ways, but I've actually found that sometimes a home run text texts are actually harder to preach. It's kind of like um, on Good Friday and Easter. Everyone, oh, those are easy sermons to preach. But it's actually challenging because I bring the death and resurrection of Jesus into every sermon. And I and I apply it to in, and see it in every text. So then when you have the text being the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's actually, and I think a lot of pastors might know what I'm talking about, it's actually can be more challenging than you, you think. But from everything I've said so far about the gospel, about uh, it being central and, and to not make it just be, to lead people to understand how is it you know that they're, they're saved? How is it you know that they will rise again? How is it you know that they are in Jesus and in the eternal presence of Christ? Here's a text where you can easily, easily do that. And like I said earlier, you find then in preaching the text, the context. So what is the context? Well, in this, this is Jesus after he washes his disciples' feet. He says, you know, he says someone's going to, you know, will betray him. He he says that, tells Peter that uh, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so, and this is a trembling time for them. Uh, they are not understanding Jesus keeps on talking where I'm I'm going and they're like where are you going <laughs> what are you talking about okay and uh, Jesus will be dying the next day they're gonna be upset they're gonna be feel fearful for themselves uh, with Jesus bringing out like to Peter you're gonna deny deny me three times their own weakness is gonna be right there before them and and uh, kind of wondering not understanding Jesus' death. And so when we get to this text in John chapter 14, Jesus starts to answer some of these things. He starts out, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Here Jesus equates himself with God. You believe God. You believe me. Now this is something I I hope to bring out in the sermon. Okay, And I do this actually a lot. Where when I talk about salvation... This is what God says. And kind of, don't just take my word for it. This is not talking about opinions here. This is what Jesus says. You hear it, right? You heard what Jesus said. Well, this is the way it is. And so he says, Jesus talks this way himself. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he explains that he is going to prepare a place. And, and when going and preparing a place, inherent in, in that is his death and resurrection. He's not just dying, he's rising, and he's going to prepare a place. And so in that, you have a wonderful way of talking about the death and resurrection. And then, it's, it's even more profound than that then, because, especially for the sake of the funeral service, he basically says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So his death and his resurrection says something about you. He's going to your father's house. And if he goes, he will come again to bring you where he is. And so, to simply know that Jesus is the way is to look at his death and resurrection. He is the way. He is the way this happens. This is how you know. This is how you know the resurrection of Jesus means everything for you. How can you be sure that the one, your loved one is alive in Christ? Well, what does Jesus say? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And uh, just listen to the Father. Listen to the Son. This is what he says. So, as I, I get into this, um, uh, at the beginning of the sermon... Uh, I will try to have a simple greeting. I will uh, bring the listener of the sermon into the context of the text. Um, I will place them, in a sense, in the shoes of the disciples 
where I will will probably try to bring the listeners into that context the text and explain things of that context that I will be easily be able to transfer them it to them and their questions and what they're going through. Because a lot of times if they can recognize a certain idea or thought in someone else, they can recognize it in someone else easily rather than seeing it in themselves. So you you point it out in someone else and then you say, now see it in yourself, which is what Jesus did all the time in parables, didn't he? Uh, um, so, so if they can recognize uh, how Jesus answers disciples in this context the night before he dies, then they should be able to transfer this idea and these questions and how Jesus answered these questions to their inner dialogue in the context of the funeral setting. Um, and so, here we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for our consideration is from our Gospel reading from John chapter 14. A text, I might add, chosen by Alice. A dear family of Alice, friends of Alice and brothers and sisters in Christ, It is good for all of you to be here this morning, for nothing would please Alice more than for you to be here in God's house, hearing God's word, singing God's truth of life and salvation, and the joy of the resurrection. She made my funeral preparations easy She picked the hymns we sing. She picked the Bible readings we hear because she wanted these in your ears and on your lips this very morning. She was meticulous because she wanted you to hear about Jesus. She wanted you to hear about you have a God who is so diligent in his care that he does not slumber nor sleep. She wanted you to hear from Isaiah how we are clothed in the garment salvation who covers us in the robes of God's own righteousness. She wanted you to hear this morning how God prepares a place for you through our Lord Jesus Christ, a place in the Father's house, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So, uh, in case you're wondering, uh, I'm doing this a little differently because I ran out of time. I, I, I did the, the first part of ours, and then I was going to do it, write a little bit, and then talk about it, and write a bit, and talk about it. Well, I wrote it, and I ran out of time to record the, that part of the podcast, so we are actually now after the fact. What you are hearing is the actual sermon in the uh, in the in the funeral itself so the actual sermon that i had and uh it might give me an opportunity to talk about how there were actually is differences in what's in the page that i wrote and what i actually preached um i use sometimes some biofeedback of how people are listening what they're perking their ears to uh and it changes sometimes uh because I, I use that kind of, I call it biofeedback, to, to uh, it's like a conversation for me. It, it does change how I word some things. So um, that might give me an opportunity to do that. But also, um, uh, in the greeting now, you hear um, what I talked about earlier from at the beginning is this was important to Alice, and this is her confession of faith. These words are what Alice wanted them to hear. They were very important to her. She picked them for a reason. And there's nothing wrong, I don't think, in, in bringing that out to the listener. 
of the sermon to the people there, the family gathered. This is what is important. And uh, don't let them wiggle out of that because because uh, everyone has their opinion. Well, this was important. This was important. Well, we know uh, she painstakingly in very great detail picked out these readings and picked out the hymns. Uh, I, I know if you might notice uh, the, the psalm that she wanted was Psalm 121, um, and I reference that in the one part, and I do reference uh, Isaiah a little bit, um, and then the gospel reading. So as I get into that part now, we will look into the context that I placed, just like I talked about earlier. When we look at our text and its context, it came in a very tumultuous time for the disciples. Jesus said these words the night before he died. He had already washed their feet. He had already even predicted that he was going to be betrayed. In fact, he had already predicted that Peter would deny him three times. He was saying things like, I'm going. And they were wondering, Jesus, where are you going? That night and the next day, the disciples were confronted by a few things. Their own sin. Their worry about being separated from Jesus. They'd be frightened as Jesus himself would be crucified. Many reasons to be afraid. Many reasons to mourn. Many reasons to be sad. All right, I'm going to stop it there for a second. One thing I'm, I'm actually following with the written word, the handwritten word of my sermon notes, and uh, I'm realizing just how much uh, I'm actually deviating from the written word. I did not realize it did that so much. So I'm learning something even as I'm listening to it. Um, but uh, here, as you listen, how I wanted to kind of paint the text and what's going on and do it in a way that fits the context of them. So they're afraid. They're sad. They're upset. They may not understand death. And so that when Jesus addresses the disciples, he also then, in turn, are addressing those who are gathered. Jesus, knowing this, addressed his disciples. He said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Those are powerful words. As he addresses them, he says, These are the words that I speak come from the full authority of God. In my house are many rooms, and I am going to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you to myself that you may be where I am also. Think about what Jesus is saying in those words. He is telling them that in his upcoming death, that it is for them. His upcoming death is so wonderful that they will have a place in the Father's house. His upcoming resurrection is far more than his death and resurrection, but he opens up to them as well. I am going to prepare a place for you, that where I be, you will go also, breaking the bonds of death, showing us a way from death to life. While they're afraid of just the next two days, Jesus was preparing them for eternity. Even as their own weakness was on display, even as their own sadness was on display, he points them to the resurrection that they will be given. I realize here a couple things. One is, some of that uh, was added to what I had written down, um, where I go back to the weakness and that kind of thing. Part of that was kind of judging reaction of, of people listening. And also, um, I notice here, too, that I, I get kind of loud and animated. I don't necessarily do that on purpose, necessarily. I mean, 
you know, I don't avoid it necessarily. And I, I realize sometimes that I know when I listen to it, it can be a little much, which is probably good why you should listen to it. Because it, I'm, I'm, I learn more too. I, I learn that my, I'm not a very precise in my grammar and my words. And I fumble a little loud, fumble. <laughs> that's kind of funny. I fumble some. Um, and that's because that's just the way it is. I can work on that, work on that and work on that. And, and, uh, it's still going to be me. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not necessarily getting all worked up for dramatic effect. That's just me feeling strongly about it. So um, so for the listener, and, and uh, um, I can understand how maybe it sounds angry or something like that. That's not what I mean to do, but that's just, you know, how it comes across. So I am showing a little vulnerability here in listening to it and going through it with you because it's not any pastor can tell you it's not easy to listen to themselves but uh, I really feel feel strongly about what I'm saying and I'm kind of listening to to how they're listening so to speak and so I, I did add some stuff there this leads Thomas to say Lord we do not know where you are going how can we know the way Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know the way to the Father's house? I am the way, Jesus says. And in his death, he shows a way to eternity by rising to life. Not just his life, but the life of his children. He is the way sinners are washed clean. He is the reason that we can rise from the grave. He is the reason that we can dwell in the Father's house for all eternity. And remember, Jesus makes sure that this is clear in our own ears. Remember, he makes sure that they know this comes from the authority of God himself. And you can argue all you want about this, but God himself asks us, asks us to trust in his word. He is a God who creates and sustains all life. He is a God by whom all wisdom begins. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if he says it, it is true. And so now, God's word, and you heard it from Jesus himself, God's word gives me no other option than say to you this very morning that Alice is alive in Christ forever. She follows the way. The way that Jesus repaired from death to life. Jesus was born for her He fulfilled all of God's law for her in her place. He suffered in her place all that her sins deserve. And he showed the way to the Father. He showed that nothing can stand in the way from Alice and her heavenly Father in his heavenly kingdom. How do I know? Jesus promised it. Jesus, her brother, born fully human as she was born, entered the grave as she enters the grave, and he rose that she might rise and with the power of God himself, just as a loud crack rolling of a stone away. Jesus will open her grave and bring her home. And this is how I know. Jesus said so. He is the life. When Jesus here speaks of life, he's not talking about some empty, metaphysical, distant, abstract kind of life that we think about. He says he is a life as the creator and designer of life. He speaks as a one who caused the heart to beat within your own chest. He is a one who says so as a one who knit you together in your mother's womb and causes your heart to beat every day, your breath to be taken this very moment. 
uh, one quick note. Um, that whole section on the beating heart, uh, the breath, um, being knit together in your mother's womb, that actually was something I added while I was preaching. Uh, as I was preaching, I was looking across the family and uh, the children and the grandchildren, and and a, as the mother, um, I, I was thinking about how I'm talking about life and that I was thinking about how she as a mother played an important part. God used her in that life. And so even while I was preaching, I was thinking how how God knit them together in the mother's womb and how her calling and vocation as mother led them to be a part of that life that they're remembering in the funeral. And so actually that was a thought that I had while I was actually preaching the sermon, not written in my my text and my manuscript that I added there because because I was looking at them and I was looking at them in the eye and I was, I looked at them and I saw <laughs> I mean it's, it's, I know it's gonna sound cheesy um, I was looking at uh, her sons and I saw her their mother's eyes in their own eyes and it it made me think of uh, their own heart. Um, how they were knit together in the mother's womb and how God gave that to them and how the mere fact that they are living and breathing as a result of God using their mother is the same God who's going to raise their mother from the dead. And and so that's where that came from. I was actually preaching it, looking at the family, looking at her sons, seeing uh, uh, their mother's eyes in them and... Uh, I added that part to the sermon. It's, I guess it's part of that kind of biofeedback that I was talking about earlier. He is the same creator of life who asked after his resurrection, he asked Thomas, put your fingers where the nails were. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. It wasn't some empty, metaphysical, distant, abstract type of life. It was a real resurrection and a real life. And so it is with Alice. Not just some strange metaphysical spiritual understanding. God grants her a real life. A real body raised from a real grave. But not just life, but life as it was meant to be. Life better than we know it seeing light brighter than our eyes have ever seen, food sweeter than anything our mouths have tasted, voices singing praises more perfectly than we have sung this very morning. And ears perfect to hear the voice of Jesus. For in the middle of all of this, the greatest joy that Alice could ever have is to be with Jesus. And that is where she is. With Jesus. How do we know? Well, you heard Jesus, didn't you? I'm coming back to bring you with me. United with Christ, Alice will never be separated again. And if any of you are still wondering, how can this be? How can this be true? Listen how Jesus explains this, is, this to his own disciples. Believe in God, believe in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am preparing a place for you. I am going to take you to myself. It was that authority of word that God baptized Alice in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was that authority by which God fed her the very body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins to show. God has spoken. And it is so. And so now, precious Alice, your precious mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, friend, is alive in Christ forever. Forever.
So here I, I sought to um, continue to, like I said at the very beginning, show them how this can be, how it is that we can know. Where exactly does Jesus say these things so that uh, they're confronted directly with God's word and not my personal authority, my own personal words, but by what Jesus says. And so now at that point then, as I like to do and as Alice would want me to do, I then now transition it to the listener and, and what it means for them as they gather together. These are words... Alice was very intent on you hearing for yourself this morning. You don't think she just picked those verses for her own sake, did she? She picked them for you. She picked them because she loved you. She picked them out of faith because she loves you and she wants you to know the same joy a mother in that situation is never concerned for herself. She knows where she is in Jesus. She wants you to hear for yourself the promises that Jesus himself has said. So that when you think of Alice, your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, your friend, you think of the love and mercy of Jesus himself not only to comfort you in mourning, but to comfort you like Jesus did when they were scared, when they were afraid, when they were mourning. He pointed to the life that they have in him. In the same way Alice loved you, she was meticulous in wanting you to know that Jesus is your way. Jesus is your truth. Jesus is your life. He is your hope when you are comforted, comforted and confronted with your sin. He is your strength and your weakness. He is your life in the midst of death. And when I talk about life, I'm not talking about some spiritual, metaphysical type of a thing. I'm talking a real life springing from the grave. A real promise fulfilled in Jesus. And that is our strength and our hope today. That that promise is now fulfilled for Alice. She is alive in Christ forever. God has wiped away every tear from her eyes. God will raise her up from the grave she is placed in today. Alice, a child gathered around the feet of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Well, there you go. Um, I don't need to go into much further detail because uh, I've talked about it a lot. So um, I enjoy doing these uh, Anatomy of a Sermon episodes, um, and uh, I enjoy this one. I, I really, I really like to preach, um, and uh, I, I listen to a sermon like that, and and I, I do hear a lot of imperfect wording. Uh, I, I'm not a perfectionist in, in those ways. Um, and that's always, I, I, it's always good for a pastor to listen to sermon and, and think about those things, but, uh, kind of let you know what, what go, kind of goes through a pastor's mind when he, he prepares a funeral sermon. And, uh, to me, I guess when it put it all together is, is, um, I like it because I really do care about, I really cared about Alice and, uh. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's like, you know, you're, you're at a church for over 20 years. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, it, it, it's, I really have grown to understand what it means to be a brother and a sister. And, uh, you know, I've said many times that uh, when I preach, um, it's very personal 
more personal than people might realize. And that's because um, I, in the sermon, was rejoicing myself. Um, I take took great comfort in, in the authority of Jesus' words and what he says. When he says about Alice, even in regards to the uh, the imperfect pastor that she had <laughs> for for these years. So, um, so you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I I got a little passionate, and that's not necessarily on purpose. It just, you know, I cared a lot about her too. So, tell me what uh, you think about uh, the sermon. Um, some things that struck a chord with you. Some pastors, uh, what are some things that I miss when you think about uh, writing a funeral sermon and and what kind of things go through your mind as well? I'd love to hear that. Um, this not isn't necessarily a representative of all because every sermon is different. There are other aspects in a funeral sermon uh, that I didn't bring up, um, and there's many things that every sermons where I might focus on some things more than other. But let, let me know what you think. Um, you can get a hold of us at Clerical Airs, uh, P, P for Podcast on Twitter, at me, bro. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. And uh, I'd love to hear hear from you. So uh, I am Bullhagen, and may your sermons have an anatomy. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast, on Twitter at clerical heirs P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to clerical heirs. See you next time.